Good evening. Hopefully you've all had a good week. And I am very thankful that it's Friday. Finally the weekend. Open those blue hymnals to 774. When the roll is called up yonder. 774. shall sound and time shall be no more and the morning breaks eternal bright and fair when the saved of earth shall gather over on the other shore and the roll is called up yonder I'll be there when the roll is called up yonder when the roll is called up yonder when the roll is called up yonder Just a couple pages forward to 778. Sweet by and by. Shine. 
Thank you again, ladies. Welcome. It's good to see each of you back here again. Uh, and just a reminder, if you've been here five nights, be sure and pick up your Bible promise book. How many of you have one of these now? Wow, there's a lot of hands going up. I don't know why I said anything. I think everybody's got one. <laughs> And then the Bible, I know some of you just got one tonight, and some of you have been looking at them, you enjoying it? It's a beautiful Bible, isn't it? And like someone mentioned to me, Carol mentioned to me, she said, you know, it works great to put in your car, too, because it doesn't take up much space. And so you can always have a Bible with you that way. And then we want to remind you of the Strong's Concordance, you know, every word in the Bible in here, and, uh, and how to find it in the Hebrew and Greek, if you want to know the original meanings of it. And that comes with 15 nights. And so we're halfway through tonight. But I want to let you know that we're going to have some extra meetings. So if you would like, tomorrow morning at 11 o'clock, uh, yeah, yep. tomorrow morning at 11 o'clock, Joel's going to be speaking on law and grace. Sometimes there's real confusion about that today. And Romans 6 says, you know, we're no longer under the law but under grace. What does that mean? And he's going to be talking about the covenants and how do we relate to the law. So come tomorrow morning at 11 o'clock for that. Th this evening, of course, he's going to be talking about seances, and I find that kind of ironic. I had a funeral yesterday. Um, I've been here just about four years, and I've had 35 funerals since I've been here. Yeah. So I'm thinking, is it me? <laughs> so it's interesting that you would talk about that, and so uh, I'm kind of anxious to see what you have to say, especially when we talk about, you know, there's a real rise in spiritualism nowadays and the occult and these kinds of things that are going on. And so you're just looking at a television lineup and the kind of programs they have. So it'll be interesting to see what he has to say. Now, Wednesday when you came, we gave you an envelope, and you may have gotten one this evening. At the end, if you would like to, to drop it off, we're going to have an usher at the back, and this is for an offering. Now, again, you're under no obligation. We appreciate it if you can give, but if you choose not to or can't give, that's fine. No big deal. We aren't under any pressure at all, and so there will be an usher back there if you'd like to give an offering. Okay, at this time, we're going to continue on with our theme song. Well, good evening. You're all back. Fantastic. Glad to see you here. You know, Jesus is coming again, right? We've been talking about it off and on multiple times that the Lord is coming again. Jesus is literally, physically, bodily, visibly, audibly, he's coming again, right? And for sure, because the Bible tells us so. And so we're going to study tonight some interesting things about not only the second coming, a little bit about why Jesus is coming. But uh, we're going to be talking about seances and ghosts. But the last time we were together, you know, we studied about cults, right? And I had some conversations with some of you and said, hey, that hit pretty close to home. And so we're going to review a little bit about we, what we talked about because the Bible was very clear about, about some of the issues that the cults talked about and different things. And we wanted to make sure that, hey, you know what? The Bible is our, that's our fast and solid foundation, isn't it? It's the Bible. What was our quiz questions from the other night? We talked about cults. Are cults a real and present danger in the world today? What would you say? Sure they are. You know what? The Bible tells us that at the end there would be false doctrines and, and spiritual deceptions, and doctrines of demons and spirits and, and all these kind of things going on. So we have to be careful. It's out there. Uh, quiz question number two. Cults often require their followers to separate themselves from others 
God asks his followers, this is in contrast, God asks his followers to be in the world as two things, what and what? I gave you hints there. When Jesus says you are the what of the earth? Salt and light, right? Instead of secluding yourself and not being out in the public and not mingling with the people like some of the cults require their people to do, God wants us just the opposite. We're to be a separate people, remember? But we're to be different how? We're not supposed to be worldly. We're supposed to be Christ-like, but we're to be in the world. We're salt. We're to season the world with the Christ-likeness and the character of God and, and the love of Christ with the people we meet. And, and we're to be light. We're to be there to, to be giving glory to God in our lives so that we're shining that light upon the Word of God and, and people glorify the Lord when they see us, right? And so that's what we're supposed to be. Totally opposite of what some of the other places teach. Quiz question number three. What is our only safeguard against false teachers, false religions, and false prophets? The Bible. I had to hint, right? <laughs> Did you get that hint? That's it right here. It's the Bible. The Scripture is your only safeguard. You can't depend on a person. You can't depend on some other book about the Bible. You have to depend on Scripture and Scripture alone. The Bible is your only safeguard to keep you from being drawn off onto, onto dangerous ground. And, and so we want to make sure we hold on to the Scriptures the way that it needs to be held on to which is firmly, right? And what did I say the other night? You need to read your Bible. You need to study your Bible. You need to pray before you do and uh, keep reading it and keep studying it. You have to hold on to that. That's our important, important lifeline. Tonight we're going to talk about the Bible truth about seances and ghosts, which is the only truth that we want to know here, right, is the Bible truth. Amen? We don't want to know some other truth. We want to know the Bible truth about everything we're talking about. So before we begin tonight, because it's a very serious and, and desperately serious topic, um, I'm going to kneel. I'm going to ask the Lord to be with us. I ask you to bow your heads and pray with me. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for another day. Lord, that you've given each and every one of us not only the safety of the day, but you've provided for us. Lord, you've brought us here together this evening. Lord, to lift up your name in praise as we've done. Lord, to open your word as we're about to do. And so, Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit would be here attending to our hearts and our minds, Lord, that your word would open up to us an understanding not only just of what your word says about these things, seances and ghosts and such, but, Lord, what it says about you and your character and your love for us. I pray that... You would move upon each and every one of us as you need to. That we would have open hearts and open minds for you to speak to tonight. We thank you for your presence here, for we know that it's here. We know you are here, Lord. Your, your word promises that where two or more are gathered, there you are in their midst. So we know you're here with us tonight, Lord, and we thank you for that promise. And so we stand firmly upon your word that says the Holy Spirit will be sent to lead us and guide us into all truth. And we thank you for your leading tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. The Bible truth about seances and ghosts. So, question tonight. Why is Jesus coming again? Why is he coming again? Now, the Bible gives us a couple of different reasons why Jesus is coming again. We're going to look at them this weekend. We're going to study why Jesus is coming again. A lot of it has to do with judgment. Okay. A lot of it has to do with judgment. But why is Jesus significantly coming again? Why is he specifically coming again? Look what he says in John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. There the Bible says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house were many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again to receive you unto myself, that where I am... There ye might be also. Remember a few nights ago, we looked at all those texts about the heart of God. And he says, oh, I want to live among my people. I want to dwell among my people. And Jesus is saying, look, I'm coming back so that where, you, where I am, there you can be also. I'm coming back because I missed you. <laughs> I, want to, I want us to be together. Jesus is coming back so we can be together. Right? He's coming because he wants us to be where he is at. That's one of the reasons Jesus is coming again. And the Bible tells us that Jesus, speaking here in Revelation 1.18, He says, I am He that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. 
he says, and have the keys of hell and death. Okay, so Jesus is coming back so he can be where we can be with him. And he says, I hold the keys of hell and death. Now, in, in some ideas, the devil holds the keys to which one of those? Hell, right? A lot of people think the devil holds the keys to hell. But that's not what the Bible says. Jesus holds the keys of hell. And he holds the keys of death as well. And you know, the idea about death, this whole idea about hell and death, and, and it's really become quite a thing in the world today. You know, this idea of spiritualism. I don't know if that's a term you know, but spiritualistic activities, seances and, 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 and people hunting ghosts and talking to the dead, it's all the rage. I mean, the world is fascinated with it. Uh, you'd look on your television, you look on the sci-fi channel, all it is is satanic things, right? It's all about witches, and it's all about ghosts, and it's all about dead people, and it's all about zombies, which are undead, or whatever they are, right? You know, they're made up. they got good makeup as well, but they are. And it's got all of this stuff, and it's all about those who are dead, or speaking to those who once were dead, or ghosts coming back and haunting. And you go through the television, and it's ghost hunters all over the place, and mediums. This, this lady, this Long Island medium, it's one of the top shows in television, she sits there and she connects with your dead relatives on television. And, and you have magazines galore that are channeled magazines. And you're like, well, what's a channeled magazine? A channeled magazine is when someone sits down and they claim that another spirit fills them and they write, they have no idea why they're writing it, what they're writing. This other being has come in, the spirit of a dead person, they're speaking to, they're channeling, and they come through them, either they speak it and they write it down or they just write it, automatic writing. And, and there's magazines, just that's all the magazines are, are channeled articles. Wisdom from the grave. That you know, people have died and gone on before us, and now we can connect with them, these, these mediums and these psychics and these channelers. They can connect with them, and they, they connect with their mind, whether they have Ouija boards or what seances and all this kind of stuff. They connect, and they say, oh, this is what the real wisdom is, because you, you know, you're not yet enlightened, you're still alive. So when you die, that's when you're becoming enlightened and, and we're sharing with you all that knowledge. And so they're saying that when you go beyond the grave, now there's wisdom and we're coming back to share with you all this wonderful wisdom that you can know and we're going to share it with you. But is that really true? How do you know what is really truth? How do you know if that's true? Are we being deceived? Are you really, how do you know? What's your safeguard? This is our safeguard, isn't it? How do you know? Well, in order to understand it, to understand deception, who was the originator of deception? Does anybody remember? Satan was the originator of the deception because he was a liar from the beginning, the Bible says. We have to go back to Genesis to understand this whole topic. Genesis chapter 2, verses 16 and 17. We find the devil hanging around in a tree, right? He's a snake. He's, and Eve comes up to him, and he's speaking to Eve there in the Garden of Eden. And the Bible says, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. Is that what God said? That's in the Bible. That's exactly what God said. Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat. In verse 17 it says, But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which is the tree the devil decided to hang out in, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt do what? Surely die. You eat of it, you're going to die. That's what God's words were. Do you believe God? I believe God. Thou shalt surely die. But the snake didn't say that. Satan came and deceived Eve, and he says this, The serpent said unto the woman, You shall not surely die. So who do you believe, God or the devil? It's a simple question, right? If you're a Bible-believing person, it's a simple question. You either believe God saying that if you eat of this tree, which means if you disobey me, really is what he's saying, if you disobey me, because it wasn't in the fruit. You realize that, right? The, the, that knowledge, the tree of knowledge of good and evil was a beautiful tree. Beautiful tree, and the fruit was beautiful and luscious to look at. That's why it was tempting to Eve, because she saw it was good for food. It looked good. It was pleasing to the eyes. So it was a beautiful tree. It wasn't some ugly, gnarly-looking dead tree. It was a beautiful thing. And, but it wasn't the fruit Unless it was maybe avocado. No, avocados are good. No, it, it wasn't the fruit. What it was was the disobedience to God. The disobedience to God. 
And God says, you shall surely die. The devil says, no, you're not going to die. But then in John 8, 44, Jesus tells us that we can't trust the devil at all. You made the right choice. He says, you are of the father, speaking to the Pharisees at the time, uh, you are of the father of the devil, and the lusts of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and he abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. So the devil is a liar. And so when he's hanging around and he says, you shall not surely die, which means you're going to keep on living, he was lying. The Bible says so. Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, we'll go back and we'll understand a little bit better. How do we understand this? This idea of being able to go and speak to the dead? Well, first we have to understand how we were made so we can understand how all of this works. Oftentimes it helps to go back to the beginning. And so we're going to go back to the beginning. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, the Bible says, The Lord God formed man, that's you and me, mankind, out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Now, I underlined a couple of key terms in this verse. Man formed us out of what? Dust. And he breathed into us, our nostrils, the breath of life, and man became a living soul okay those are very three important things that's the whole context and now we look at it so it's dust and breath and soul the word dust is just dust it's dirt like clay it in breath is the hebrew word ruach which means to breathe it's breath it's just it's the wind in your lungs that's what it means and soul is the hebrew word nefesh which means living being okay so god breathed into you breath wind And you became a living being, a living soul. So what happens when you die? Okay, now we have to understand this. This, We've got to understand the process so we can understand how we know if we're being lied to and we're being talked to by people that have gone on before us. Ecclesiastes 12, verse 7, what happens when we die? It says, and then shall the, what? Dust return to the earth as it was, and the spirit, which is the Hebrew word, it's the same as wind, it's like your breath, the spirit shall return to God who gave it. So your breath, your wind, your ruach, it's translated both breath and spirit, okay, in the Old Testament. So you have, you have this wind in you, right? All of us breathing? Yeah, it's a couple breathing. Are we all breathing? Good, we're all breathing. So you have wind in you, you have ruach in you. You have wind in you, and you're, the rest of you is made up of dust. Okay, And if your wind leaves you, you're no longer breathing, you are dead, and your body, your dust, returns to the clay which it came from. And the breath goes back to God. The breath, just a, whew, the wind in your lungs goes back to God. The, you might say the life-giving energy that God put into your body, that goes away, and you die. And so that's what it is. So you can look at creation and death, it like equations, right? Opposite equations. In creation, God took dust and breathed into us the breath of life, and man became a living soul. At death, your soul, you, you, be, you lose your breath, and you return to the dust that God made you. Does that make sense? Is it pretty clear? That, I mean, it's so far pretty clear in the Bible, right? And so in Genesis, now listen to this, how what it says, though. The Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. God didn't put a soul in you, right? Because oftentimes when we see the word soul, don't you think, oh, that's that conscious entity that's in me that's when I die that's going to go either to heaven or hell, right? That's what people are contacting, when people die, right? If somebody dies, then they're going to have a seance and they're going to contact the soul of the ones who've died, right? Am I right or am I wrong? Isn't that the concept? I mean, that's the whole concept, right? And so, so, but the Bible doesn't say God put a soul in you or that you have one. It says you are a soul. Dust plus breath equals a soul. You are a soul. You are a living being. As a matter of fact, the Bible uses that same term soul, not just to describe you and me as human beings, but all living animals on the face of the planet. Job chapter 12, verses 7 through 10, the Bible says, Just now ask the beasts, and they shall teach thee, and the fowls of the air, and they shall tell thee. Or speak to the earth, and it shall teach thee, and the fishes of the sea shall declare unto thee. Who knoweth 
Not in all these that the hand of the Lord hath wrought this, in whose hand is the soul of every living thing, the beasts and the fishes and the birds of the air. They all are a soul because they are all living beings. And the breath of all mankind, the Bible says, the wind in the lungs of all mankind and the soul, the living being of every thing there revelation 16 3 the bible says and the second angel poured out his vial upon the sea and it became as the blood of dead men and every living soul died in the sea is all the fish that's what it's saying all the fish and all the creepy crawly things that live under the water every living being every living creature died in the sea so the soul does not mean some conscious separate entity of your body because when god made you he made you out of two things not three he made you out of dust, and He made you out of breath. There's nothing else to you, folks. Nothing else to you. You have a mind that works wonderfully. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. You have a mind, so you have intelligence. You have a heart that, when you say heart, you have emotion, right? You have this spiritual aspect to us. We have this emotional aspect, and we have a body. The, body, the, the Bible talks multiple times about spirit, soul, and body. Mind, heart, and physical body. That's what we're made of. That's how God put us together. He didn't put us together as dust and breath and then some separate entity that he had on the shelf that he stuck into you at some point in time that's going to have consciousness that's going to go on somewhere. That's not what the Bible says. And so we have to read the Bible and understand what the Bible says, but that's kind of different than what most of us think. Now, in Psalm 104, verse 29, the Bible says, Thou hidest thy face, and they are troubled. Thou takest away their breath, they die and return to their dust. See, the Bible says it over and over and over again, the same process going back. Nothing else leaves them. The breath goes, but their conscious entity doesn't go. They just, whoosh, they're gone. And so it's kind of interesting when you think about it, because when you're thinking about it, you know, I know it happens, because when I was studying the Bible, I come to this and I say, well, what's, what, what happened to my immortal soul, right? What happened to that, my spirit, right? Because my spirit is going to go on when I die, and when I, if I'm a good person, it's, my spirit is going to go to heaven, and when I die, my spirit, if I'm a bad person, is going to go to hell, right? And that's, that's what I believe. But that's not what the Bible is teaching. And so when I'm studying the Bible, I'm saying, hey, wait a minute, I need to know what the Bible says, because here's two key things. One, the Bible describes the character of God in two ways. It describes the character of God in terms of his justness, in terms of his judgment. And remember the other night we saw that the law of God was just as exactly like the character of God because the law of God, the Ten Commandments, and God himself are described exactly the same all the way through the Bible. We saw all those different things. Everything was the same. So the law, the justness, the righteousness, the judgment of God is part of his character. On the other side of that character, an equal sustainability, an equal strength, an equal weight is the gospel, which is the other aspect of God's character, which we see in mercy. Okay, so you, you think, of, think of the second commandment. You know, it says, you know, God visiting the iniquity of fathers upon the third and the fourth generation of them that hate me. There's that justice, that judgment, but showing mercy unto thousands of those who love me and do what? Keep my commandments, he says. So you see the judgment, the justness of God, and the mercy of God. That's his entire character right there. But you can't remove one from the other. And you can't say, well, God is just mercy. Because he's not just mercy. He's also justice. He's also judgment. He's also righteousness. He's holy. And you can't say God is just holy, righteous, and justice and forget about his mercy because we'd all be in very much trouble, right? We would all be lost because we can't stand up to that. We need the mercy and the, the gospel of God so that we might be able to stand in his judgment. And that's why the Bible says in Joel, he says, who shall I be able to stand in the great day of God's wrath? Well, you and I will if we're covered by the blood of Jesus. Okay, But that's because God has justice and God has mercy. So how does that apply to understanding about my mortal soul, my immortal soul? What happens to the spirit of mine? Well, it's interesting to note that you know, when the Bible talks about God putting us together, He never says that He gave us an intelligent spirit that went into us, anything that has consciousness. Okay? The Bible describes us as being dust and breath. right? Dust and breath. You might think of it this way. You have a pile of boards over here and you have a box of nails over here. Breath and dust, okay? And I take the nails and I take the boards and I put them together and I make a box, right? 
The box consists of the boards and the nails that hold the box together. Okay, so now when I'm done with the box, I take all the nails out and I put them back over here, and I take the boards and I put them over here. Where did the box go? Where did the box come from? It came from a combination of boards and nails. But when the boards and the nails are separated, the dust and the breath, where does the box go? It just isn't. It just isn't. Do I remember what the box looked like? Do I remember how many boards I used? Probably. Do I remember how many nails I used? Sure. Does God remember what you look like after you die? Does God remember how many times you've done this wrong and you've done that right and you've done this and he remembers you knelt down and asked him to, and he knows all about your character. He knows every hair on your head. So when you die, you're just not. But God remembers everything about you because even right now, he knows the number of hairs on your head. He knows if you lost three or four in the comb today before you came here. God knows everything about you. Some of you, he knows he doesn't have to count hair anymore, right? (laughs) Praise God, right? You're making it easy on him. (laughs) But the fact is, that's the way the Bible describes us. That's the way the Bible describes us. So, But what about this idea of my immortal soul, this spirit that's going to go on living when I die? Where is that in the Bible? Well, it's not. It's not in the Bible. Over 1,600 times the Bible refers to the word soul. Never once in all 1,600 times does it ever say that the soul is undying or immortal. It never says that. It never says that the soul is undying or immortal. Matter of fact, it's much, much different. You know, it's, it's not this idea. It's, it's the only time it uses the word immortal. Immortal? is used only one time in all of Scripture. Here's the text in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 17. Now unto the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, to honor, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Speaking of God Himself, the Bible says He alone is immortal. That's the only time the word immortal is used in all of Scripture. Now, immortality is used a few times. We're going to look at that. Immortality in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 15 and 16 There the Bible says, Which in his times he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Who's he talking about? Jesus, right? King of kings and Lord of lords. He's talking about Jesus. Who, how, what's that next word? Only. Who only hath what? Immortality. Do you and I have anything in us that's immortal, according to the word of God? Zip. Nothing. Oh, who only hath immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach, unto whom no man hath seen, nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. So only God is described as immortal. Only Jesus has immortality. And, and so, you, you getting the picture, you and I, we're not immortal. Matter of fact, the Bible tells exactly the opposite. In Job chapter 4, verse 17, it says, Shall mortal man be more just than God? Shall a man be more pure than his maker? Are you going to be more than your maker? Are you going to be equal to God? Of course not. He's your maker. right? You're the vessel. He's the potter. He made you. You didn't make him. And so the Bible says you are mortal. You and I, we are mortal means subject to death. Death, the term death, the definition is absence of life. You are subject to the absence of life. God is not. God is immortal. He's not subject to death whatsoever. You and I, we're subject to die. We're subject to death. We're mortal. Romans 6, verse 12 says, Let no sin therefore reign in your mortal body. So nothing changed from the Old Testament and New Testament there. We're still mortal. That you should obey it in the lust thereof. You have a mortal body. You have a body that if you do the wrong thing, you're going to kill it. Right? You're going to die. And you are a living soul. You are a living soul, the Bible says, and you are mortal. Matter of fact, in Ezekiel 18.4, that's exactly what it says. Behold, all souls are mine, God says. As the soul of the Father, so also the soul of the Son is mine. The soul that sinneth, it shall what? Your soul is going to die. Why? Because you are a soul. You are flesh and blood and cells, but originally you are dust and the breath that God breathed into you. And when the breath leaves you, you're just dust. 
Remember, the Bible says God remembers that we are but dust, right? He remembers we're just dust. It doesn't say he remembers we're dust in a separate, semi-conscious, you know, intelligent, half-spiritual being that's going to leave us when we die. It says you're dust. You're dust, and God has breathed into you the breath of life. So you might say, well, how in the world are we going to live forever to be with Jesus? Because if we don't have a spirit that's going to go to heaven when I die... How do we live forever with Jesus? How do we enjoy eternity together with the Lord? Well, eternity is only enjoyed by those who have the gift of immortality. But the word is gift. Because the Bible says that your immortality is a reward for your faithfulness to Jesus Christ. Let's go to back to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. You have your Bibles. Many of you have your Bibles. You should all have your Bibles because remember, you've got to check the preacher. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning in verse 51. Paul's writing, and he's excited. He says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, which means to die. But we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, What's those next four words? At the last trump. At the first trump? At the middle trump? At the three-quarter trump? At the trump at the end of the day? No, it's the last trump. At the last trump, which is the last day. It's when Jesus returns. We're going to find out when that last trump really is. Is when Jesus returns. At the moment, in, in a moment, we're going to be changed. In the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound... And the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. So there's two classes of people here at the last trump, right? The dead and we. And Paul's figuring that's those of us who are alive. So you have the dead and we. And he says the dead are going to be raised incorruptible. So obviously they hadn't been raised yet, had they? They hadn't been raised yet before the last trump. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on what? Immortality. See, immortality is your reward for faithful, loving service to Jesus throughout your life. When Jesus comes, he's bringing his rewards. Remember, he says, behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according to his works shall be. Will your works, as God judges you and he searches your heart and he looks at how you love him and what you're serving him and how you're believing and how you're acting and and he looks at the totality of your life and the commitment of your heart is the works that he sees in your life or is he going to bring you immortality? If you believe in Jesus and you let the Holy Spirit work in you, absolutely. But that's your gift is immortality for the righteous, for those who are covered with Jesus. Blood. 54 says, so when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? You know, oftentimes we think, well, if somebody dies and then death is swallowed up right away because they, they go directly to heaven. But the Bible says on the last day, after we receive immortality, after we put on incorruption, that's when death has, had its vic- has been victorious over. That's when death doesn't have anything to say anymore. It's at the last day. And so, immortality for you and I is a reward from Jesus. It's not something you and I have today. Romans chapter 2, verses 5-7, through seven, Paul speaking, he's saying, looking forward, and we're seeking. What are we seeking for? He says, But after thy hardness and impenitent heart treasurest up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. So there's the wicked people. they got wrath coming. Who will render to every man according to his deeds, that's judgment, to whom by pa- patient continuance in well-doing, that would be obedience, seek for, that's those of us who are looking for, Glory, honor, and immortality. Why would we be looking for immortality if we already have it within us? Right? The Bible says you don't have immortality in you. There's nothing in you that when you die is going to go on to be able to talk to anybody else. It's not going to be able to speak. It's not going to be able to do anything. Matter of fact, listen to how the Bible describes this. In Revelation 22, 14, Blessed are they that do His commandments, that they might have right to the tree of life, 
and, and may enter into the gates of the city. Why do we need the right to the tree of life? If we're going to live forever when we die, if we have something that goes there, why do we need to, to go to the tree of life? Because we were once taken away from the tree of life. Why did God remove Adam and Eve from the tree of life? The Bible tells us. Genesis chapter 3, verses 22 and 23. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us, to know good and evil, and to now, lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and do what? Eat and live forever. So they needed the tree of life to be able to live forever. And so if now if we want to be able to live forever, that, that immortality that Jesus is giving us, we have right to the tree of life after he comes. Not right now. Not right now. Therefore, God sent him forth out of Eden. So he sent him away. And so we don't have any immortal soul. We don't, there's nothing in you. There's no soul being. There's no spirit being within us. There's nothing of that sort. That is spiritualism. Okay? We're going we're to show you that, literally, the spiritualism. You are made up of a mind that thinks, and you can reason. You are made up of a heart that, when I'm saying heart, you're made up of your emotions, and you're made up of a physical body that has bones and blood and vessels and everything else. That's, that's you. You choose. But when you die, the box is gone. You turn to your dust. Your mind doesn't work anymore. Your heart is no more. I'll show you verses exactly from the Scripture that tell you exactly that same thing. And you're just gone. Why is it, why is it dangerous to think that I have some immortal spirit in me? Something that, and we don't maybe say immortal spirit. We say, well, my spirit is going to go on living. I'm going to die and it's going to float away. It's going to keep on living all by itself. Why is it dangerous for us to think that we have something that's going to keep on living when I die that's in me, that's part of me, that's me? Because it's a sin. It's a sin. In Isaiah 14, 14, the devil said, I will ascend above the heights of the cloud. I will be like the Most High. The devil wants to be just like God, except he doesn't want his character. He doesn't want to be pure and holy, but he, just, he, wants his judge, he wants the glory and he wants to be the rule maker. But the devil likes to make himself just like the Lord, right? Just like God. We shall have no other gods before me. And he put himself in the place of God. And when we claim that we have something immortal in us, we make ourselves as who? God. Because the Bible says that only God hath immortality. And when I start saying, hey, I am going to live forever, maybe not in this body, but I'm going to float away and live forever, whether it be in heaven or hell, or, or for the spiritualists and for the New Agers, they believe they're going, to, they're going to leave this body and shed this shell, and they're going to be set free, and they're going to join the, the cosmic consciousness, and their spirit is going to go on. Or, or some of them believe that their spirit didn't, it didn't make it to heaven, it didn't make it to hell, and it's kind of stuck in between. And so when you go into that old house on the corner of town, and you hear somebody rattling around, that's Aunt Jenny, right? I mean, that's what people believe. But the Bible doesn't teach it at all. See, when I think I have something in me that's going to go on, I make myself just like God. And I have placed myself in equal par with God. Because the Bible tells me that God alone is immortal. That God alone hath immortality. And you might think, well, that's not a big deal. I mean, that's all those spiritualists. They all think that. But no Christian would ever start saying that, well, we're equal with God. right? You would never see a, a Bible preacher, somebody who claims to be a Christian, saying, well, you know, you're immortal, so you're, you're God. But that's the danger, folks, because that's what's happening. Benny Hinn says, are you ready for some real revelation knowledge? You are God. He teaches this all the time. You are God. Because there's something in you that's going to go on living. You're going to go on living. You are God. Matter of fact, he's not alone. Kenneth Copeland says the same thing. You don't have a God in you. You are one. He says, I say this with all respect so that it doesn't upset you too bad, but I say it anyway. When I read in the Bible where Jesus says, I am, he says, I just smile and say, yes, I am too. He makes himself equal with God. Do you see the danger in holding on to a belief that is not scriptural? What happens is your doctrine gets skewed and it gets pulled aside and you don't see it right away. You know what? Ten years ago these men didn't preach this. But their doctrine has been shifting and changing and shifting because their mindset is that something in me 
is going to keep on living when I die. Well, that makes me immortal just like God, just like Jesus. And so if I'm just like Jesus, then I'm, then I'm God. I am a God. I'm a little God. I may not be the creator God, but I'm a little God. That's a sad and scary doctrine, folks. We have to beware because our only safeguard is what the Bible really does teach. What does the Bible really teach? It doesn't teach New Age spiritualism, which is exactly what they were teaching. The New Agers, the Kabbalah, you can become God. You can, you can exalt yourself and you can transcend and become God. You are a God. That's New Age spiritualism. It's occultic. It's not Christian. You, you, because they believe that because they believe they have a spirit that's going to go on living forever. Even when they die and this body turns to dust, their spirit is going to go on and live forever. They believe this because they believe that. And we have the same things happening in the Christian church. The danger is when you're speaking to somebody who says, well, I spoke to somebody who died years ago. I was speaking to, you know, the, the spirit of, of, you know, I don't know, pick somebody famous, right? President Lincoln. Mary Todd Lincoln, or who was it not long ago? They, it was in the White House, and they were having seances so they could talk to dead presidents' wives. I can't remember who that was not too long ago. I mean, that's, it, your rulers are going after seances, looking for dead people to speak to them so that they can run the country. That's spooky, for friends. That's spooky. Because the Bible says something very, very distinct about it. Take a look in Deuteronomy chapter 18. Deuteronomy chapter 18, you understand, we read this a little while back, I told you, this is why God condemns this type of thing. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, fifth book of the Bible. Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 9 through 12, the Bible says this, God speaking to his people, he says, When thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations of those nations. There shall not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire, or to use, that that's, they actually sacrifice their children by burning them alive. By the way, that was really a sick thing. They pass their children through the fire, or that uses divination, or an observer of times, that's astrology, divination is like witchcraft, an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch, or a, a charmer, or a consulter with familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer. Nowadays we would say channelers. Necromancer is someone who speaks with the dead, or the dead speak through them. Verse 12 says, For all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord, and because of these abominations the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee. Why are they an abomination to the God? Why would it be an abomination, God say, to speak to the dead? Wouldn't it be enlightening to talk to somebody who's gone on beyond life here? Well, we'd think so. But so far the Bible doesn't say that. So what, the, what we have to understand is what state we are in when we're dead. Can we be spoken to by the dead? Because that's what all these people claim, that they can speak to the dead. These seances... These ghosts that are coming back saying, oh, I used to be alive, now I'm dead, but I've seen all these wonderful things after I'm dead, and so I'm going to relate to you some grand wisdom, some great knowledge from the great beyond, right? What does the Bible say? How much wisdom is there? John chapter 11, verses 1 through 14, 11 to 14, Jesus says this, what is death like? He says, these things he said he, and after he saith unto them, our friend Lazarus sleepeth. But I go that I may wake him out of sleep. And then his disciples said, Lord, if he sleeps, he will do well. Howbeit Jesus spoke of his death. But they thought that he spoke of taking rest in sleep. And then Jesus said unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. See, the, the disciples confused this because the Jews always talked like death was sleep. So you had, to, you had to understand the context of the conversation. And they had heard Lazarus was sick. But Jesus knew that he had died, and Jesus said, he sleepeth. And he's, basically, Jesus was telling them, Lazarus is dead. Okay? Nowadays, when you run around and you tell people, that, hey, the Bible says death is asleep, like asleep, people get all worried. They, think you're all, you know, they get all kind of strange around you because they start saying soul sleep and all this kind of thing. Jesus uses the term sleep to describe death. He was very comfortable with it. So I'm comfortable with it. Don't you think? 
If Jesus says death is like sleep, we should be okay with calling death sleep. It's a sleep. And that's what it's like. The Bible says it's like a sleep. Over 60 times the Bible uses the term sleep to describe death. Matter of fact, in 1 Kings 2.10, it says, So David slept with his fathers and was buried in the city of David. Psalm 13, verse 3, the Bible says, Consider and hear me, O my Lord my God. Lighten my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. I don't know how much more clear the Bible can get on that, right? It's the sleep of death. Death is like a sleep. Job 7.21, Job says, For now I shall sleep in the dust, and shall, thou shalt seek me in the morning, but I shall not be. He doesn't say, I'll be somewhere else. He says, I just shall not be. I'm sleeping. You know, this whole idea was, this, this, this was an issue not just today, but in, all, in, the, in the history of the Reformation as well. This is, not a, this is not something new. This is biblical teaching. And in the years as the Reformation grew, the Reformers knew the same thing that we're studying tonight. That when we sleep... We don't go here, there, and yonder. We just sleep. When we die, we sleep. Matter of fact, John, Martin Luther says this. This is from uh, Luther, Scott, Lutheran scholar Dr. T.A. Cantonen from his book, The Christian Hope. And he's talking about Luther. He says, Luther, with a greater emphasis on the resurrection, preferred to concentrate on the scriptural metaphor of sleep. For just as one who falls asleep and reaches morning unexpectedly when he wakes... Without knowing what he has happened to him, we shall sure suddenly rise on the last day without knowing how we have come into death and through death. We shall sleep until he comes and knocks on the little grave and says, Dr. Martin, get up. Then I shall rise in a moment and be with him forever. That's what Martin Luther believed. He believed when he died, he was just going to go to sleep. But the next thing he knows, just like when you fall asleep, and you, know, you remember how, how tired you are after being in meetings for night after night after night after night, right? And you go to bed, and you turn to you, and you go, oh, i got to get up at 7 o'clock, and you hit the alarm, and your hit, head hits the pillow, and you're asleep. And the next thing you know, bam, 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 right? And you're like, oh, I just closed my eyes. That doesn't happen to anybody here, right? It happens to me all the time. And it's like, I didn't, did you notice the time span between the time you fell asleep and the time the alarm? You have no concept of time when you're asleep. The Bible likens death to sleep. It's saying, look, it's, it, you're not, your soul isn't sleeping. He said, death is like a sleep. It's like when you die, boom, you know nothing. And the next thing you know, Jesus is knocking on the door of your little grave saying, yoo -hoo. Actually, he doesn't say yoo-hoo. <laughs> unless that's your name. You know what he says? He looks at you and he says, Todd, come forth. Matt, come forth. Hillary, come forth. Fred, come forth. Just like when he was there, when he went to reach Lazarus. He said, my friend Lazarus sleepeth. He's dead, and he's going to show up. And I'm going to raise him from the dead. Martha was there, and she said, well, Lord, I know that he's going to raise from the dead on the last day at the resurrection. You see, we have a promise from God that there's going to be a resurrection. Why do we need a resurrection if when we die we're already there? Who wants to have a resurrection when you've already had it, right? It's like having a second party for somebody who went away and they're gone already, right? That doesn't make any sense, but we believe it in the Christian world. We've got this all twisted up because we've, we've allowed spiritualistic ideas into the church. John Wycliffe believed the same thing. John Wycliffe, he translated the Bible from, from, from Latin and all of the, the languages people didn't know into English, and people, the, the church hated him for it. Why? Because the people had the Bible. This is what John, or William Tyndale, I'm sorry, William Tyndale, he says this in an answer to Sir Thomas More, his dialogue. He says, And ye, in putting them, the departed souls, in heaven, he's saying, Look, you put all the people who died, you put them in heaven or in hell or in purgatory. He's talking to a guy from the Catholic Church. You destroy the arguments wherewith Christ and Paul prove the resurrection. He's saying, look, when you put them in heaven or hell or in purgatory as soon as they die, you destroy the arguments of Scripture that Jesus te taught. And he says, and, and again, if souls be in heaven, tell me why they, they're not as good a case as the angels be. Right? He's like, they, they ought to be fantastically happy. And then what causes there of the resurrection? Look, if you're already in heaven and you're fantastically happy, why, why, have to, why does God have to drag you back down here and dig you out of the dirt again? It's not, it's, not, it's not legitimately in the Bible. He says the true faith 
putteth, which means he sets forth the resurrection. We put forth the resurrection. God has promised the resurrection, which we be warned to look for every hour. The heathen philosophers, where did they get the idea? The, the idea that they go directly to heaven or hell or purgatory came from the heathen philosophers. The heathen philosophers, denying that, denying the resurrection, did put the souls that did ever live. They set forth, the heathen philosophers, the pagans that were flooding into the church in the ancient times, what did they say? Your soul lives forever. And the church compromised. We compromised on a lot of things in our past, haven't we? I mean, we've looked through the Scriptures and we saw, look, this is what the Bible said, but history said the, there's a church that's going to apostatize, is going to compromise, and we saw many things coming into the church that the pagans were dragging in with them because they were comfortable with it, and the church being trying to make people accommodating, and the, maybe the culture, you know how it is, we like to switch with the culture a little bit to try and to make it fit, right? We can't do that with the Bible. The Bible doesn't do it. And so we either have to get off the Bible and run our things our own way, or we have to stay with the Bible. And here it is, he says, look, they, 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 they find this doctrine from the heathen philosophers, this idea that the soul never dies, the spirit never dies, and he says, then the Pope, the leader of that church, joined the spiritual doctrine of Christ and the fleshly doctrine of the philosophers together. That's where it came from. It's called anthropological dualism. Big name, right? Dualism, sometimes people call it. Anthropological dualism. It's a Greek philosophy which says that you have a fleshly body and you have a spiritual body and what you do in the spirit is different than what you do in the flesh. And you can sin in the flesh and it's not going to affect the salvation of your spiritual body. That's anthropological dualism. That was the heathen philosophy that came into the church that William Tyndale was saying, it's not in the Bible. You destroy the hope of the resurrection that Jesus and the, all the apostles were teaching about. He says, these, he, they put these things together, the Pope, he puts these things together so contrary that they cannot agree, no more than the spirit and the flesh do in a Christian man. And because the fleshly-minded Pope consenteth unto heathen doctrine, therefore he corrupteth the Scripture to establish it. That's just history, folks. But it's directly based on the struggle over the truth of God's Word. That's the battle. That's the battle over what has God really said. Ever since the Garden of Eden, when the Lucifer stood there in, in the tree and tempted Eve and said, has God really said? Did God really say that? Are you sure? Maybe God, maybe, you know, you know that, that, and that's what's been happening all along. The devil is trying to subvert the Word of God, to misinterpret the Word of God, to bring in heathen spiritualistic doctrines like the Reformers show, show us that have happened. And it's, it gets mingled in with Scripture so much so that it's such a cloudy mess that when you sit down and you look at the Bible, and well, the Bible says this, but we believe this. Well, how do we, well, well, well let's, we just don't understand that, so let's just go on believing what we did. I'm not satisfied with that. I'm not satisfied with just believing something because somebody told me that's what we've always believed. Are you? If it contradicts what the Word of God really says? I mean, because we have to make a choice. Do you want to follow Jesus and live by every word that proceedeth from the mouth of God? Or do you want to live by tradition? That's your choice. And you're free to make that choice. God leaves you that furry freedom. But for me, I want to follow what the Word says because it's important for us if we're going to be the people who are standing with Jesus at the end of time. What does the Bible say about those who've died? Ecclesiastes 9, chapter 5 through 6, and verse, chapter 9, verses 5 through 6, and verse 10. It says, For the living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything. Neither have they any more reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Also, their love and their hatred and their envy is now perished. See, all the emotions are gone. There are, no, there are no emotions. Neither have they any more a portion forever in anything that is done under the sun. The Bible tells me that once somebody dies, they never have anything to do with anything in the world, in anybody alive, ever any, again. It's done. You can't speak to someone who's died. The Bible, if you believe the Bible, the Bible says you have nothing more to do with anything under the sun. You're not coming back to speak to anybody. 
The Bible says in verse 10 there in Ecclesiastes chapter 9, Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with all thy might, for there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave whither thou goest. Nothing to do because you're asleep. <laughs> you're sleeping. How much work do you get done when you're sleeping? Eh? I don't get anything done when I'm sleeping. Psalm 115 verse 17, the Bible says, The dead praise not the Lord, neither any that go down into silence. When I read this verse, it bothered me. Because I have beloved ones who've died, and I thought they were in heaven. I bet some of you are thinking that same thing. I know people who've died, and I was sure they were in heaven. And now, Pastor, you're telling me they're still in the ground? Yep. But it's peaceful. And here's the thing. When they died, they closed their eyes. And a moment like that is all they've experienced. We have experienced years upon years upon years of missing them, of not having them with us, remembering them. Because time goes on for us because we're alive, we're awake, we're aware. But in, when, the, when we die, we don't know anything. It's just asleep. It seems as though, to the one who dies, that it's instant. Because there's no time in the grave. You, you just die, you close your eyes like you're going to sleep. So you don't have to fear death. And those who've died, they're not, they're not, <laughs> praise God, they're not anywhere but waiting for Jesus to call their name. And you say, well, I want my loved ones in heaven. And that's a wonderful thought, but what's the other side of that thought? Those who died without Jesus, where are they? Well, then that means they've been suffering and screaming agony, right? Does that sound like something you want to hold on to? That's not the mercy of God. Because God's justice and His mercy are equal. And God has set a day. The Bible says God has appointed a day in which He will judge the world. Jesus tells us that there is coming a day of resurrection. Not just for those who believe in Him, but a resurrection for the wicked as well. We'll see that shortly. So when we say, look, the dead praise not the Lord... There, no, nobody's gone to heaven directly, and no one's gone to hell directly. When we die, we sleep. We just rest. It seems to us, if, we die, if I died today, it would seem like that, and Jesus would be calling my name. Same for you. But if I die today, and the world goes on, and Jesus doesn't come for another 50 years, then the rest of you who are alive and remain for 50 years are not going to see me for 50 years, and it's going to seem like 50 years to you. But for me, like that. For Adam, who died some 5,000 years ago or so, or maybe a little more. For Adam, it's, for us, it seems like, man, Adam, I don't even, is he really real? I mean, it's been so long ago. For Adam, when he died, and Jesus is calling his name. And all of this was, for him, didn't happen. It was just like that. And so it's, it's instantaneous for us when we die, but when we're alive, we miss them. But that's what the Bible teaches. Psalm 146, verses 3 and 4, the Bible says, Do not put your trust in the princes or in the Son of Man in whom there is no help. His spirit departs. He returns to his earth. That's his breath. His spirit departs. He returns to his earth. And that very moment, his thoughts perish. See, there's no consciousness after you die. No consciousness. John chapter 11, verses 23 and 24. What does Jesus teach? Let's... Jesus said unto her, speaking to Martha, remember, thy brother shall rise again. And Martha answers him and says, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection on which day? The last day. Remember when we receive immortality was at the last trump. The last day. She didn't say, well, I know he's, he's going to rise again. He, he's already risen again. He's been dead for four days, right? If, he, if, if they believed, if Jesus had taught and said, hey, well, when he died, he, whoosh, he went to heaven right away. No, she said, no, he's going to rise up again on the last day. That's when the resurrection was promised. The promised resurrection wasn't the moment you die. It's when Jesus returns. So if Jesus doesn't raise anybody up until the last day, and the dead who die are asleep and there's no wisdom in the grave, then when these people say they're channeling, these are very common, very popular channelers today, Jay-Z Knight and Benjamin Cream, millions of followers. Millions. They channel ancient beings. Jay-Z Knight channels some guy named Ramtha, who lived some, you know, he's from, he's some, where was he? Atlantis, right? That's where he's from. 
and he has all this wisdom. And you know what he says? There is no such thing as God. You are all one, and when you die, you're going to come and be with all of us here. And we're good. You don't have to worry about it. What she, she speaks, she teaches that the greatest deception of mankind is religion. That's what the channelers are teaching the world. But the, God says it's an abomination to say you're speaking to speak to the devil to, or to speak to the dead. It's an abomination. He says, don't do it. Why? Because he says, look, when the dead die, they have nothing more to do with anything under the sun. The, all their thoughts are perished. All their emotions are gone. There's nothing to do. They're, they know nothing. They're asleep. So who are they talking to? They have to be talking to demons. According to the Bible. They talk to demons. Seances, they're sitting around and they grab up and somebody starts speaking through the, the person channeling. Of course, it's demons. What does the Bible say? For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it's no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as ministers of righteousness, whose ends shall be according to their works. The devil has demons out there and they're at work. Don't, just, don't think that we're just walking around here with people on the earth. The Bible says we battle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. There's evil angels all around this world that are battling against you to try and get you to die in your sin. That's the devil's plan for you. God has a better plan. He sent His Son that you have accept Him as your Savior and your Lord, and you turn away from sinfulness and turn to a life of obedience and willingly follow the Lord with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your mind. And God says, I'll bring you home. And I'm going to put my angels and send them to guard you and protect you and keep you. Look what it says in 1 Timothy 4.1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in latter times some shall depart from faith, giving heed to seducing spirits. Seducing angels, spirits, demons, doctrines of devils. Those things are happening all around us. And that's what happens when someone says, oh, you know, I went to a seance and, you know, my, my, you know, my cousin it was, who'd been dead for 30 years or whatever, they came and they spoke to me and it was such a, th I was so glad that wasn't their cousin. That was a demon. Well, how can, they, how, can, how can a ghost appear and look just like my uncle who died or just like my spouse who died? Well, you know, the devil knows what you look like. Your picture's probably on the internet somewhere, right? You don't think the devil watches you? You don't think the devil and his demons, they know how you talk and how you look and how you speak and how you... I mean, the, he, he studies you and, and when you die and he wants to deceive somebody, he can show up any way he wants. You know, the devil doesn't show up with the horns and a spiked tail, Right? I don't know that he's ever showed up that way other than cartoons. But he shows up in whatever way is going to deceive you the best. Whatever way tempts you the most away from the truth of God. That's how he's going to show up. And it's all about spiritualism. Spiritualistic practices that have worked their way not only into the world but into the church. Spiritualism is a belief in communication with dead the belief that the spirits of the dead can, people can communicate with the living, especially through mediums. That's what spiritualism is. It's a practice of communicating with the dead. The practice is used among people who believe that communication occurs between the dead and the living. That's what spiritualism is. That's what's been brought in from the pagan and the occult into the Christian belief system. Synony synonymous words would be mediums, clairvoyants, seers, psychics, mystics, shamans, diviners, all of those things. That's what God says in an abomination because you're not talking to people who've gone on, you're talking to demons and devils. Because when we die, we sleep. Now, in Luke chapter 23, you know how it is when you're running through the Bible and you have all this Bible and this Bible says this, Bible says this, Bible says this, it's all in harmony and you get to one text and you're like, oh, that doesn't seem to fit, right? Have you ever done that? You're like, I don't understand how this works into it. Well, that's we're going to look at one of those verses in Luke chapter 23. Because when Jesus is dying on the cross, he has a conversation with a young man who's dying next to him on, a, on the cross as well. In Luke chapter 23, Jesus says some very famous words. Luke 23 and verse 43. And Jesus says unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, 
Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. And I'll have people come up to me and say, well, you know, preacher, Jesus said that that thief was going to be with him that day in heaven. He's going to be with him that day. So obviously when he died, as soon as he died, his spirit went to be with the Lord in heaven. And I say, well, that's fine if you look at that verse alone, but what about the rest of the Bible text? What about the rest of the Bible? Does that mean that Jesus, when he was speaking through the Holy Spirit, writing the rest of the Bible, that, that he was wrong? Does that mean that the Apostle Paul said later on, after Jesus rose again from the dead, said, you know, well, no, it, it doesn't matter because the, we're going to receive immortality at the second coming, at the last trump? So how do we understand this verse? Right? Because it seems as though Jesus is saying something in total contrast to everything that the Bible has said so far tonight. Does it, right? I mean, it does to me when I read it. So let's take a look at it. When Jesus died, he says, he says here that today you shall be with me in paradise, right? So let's take a look at another text in John chapter 20. Take your Bibles and turn over to the Gospel of John chapter 20. We're going to look at the day when Jesus arose here. We're going to look at two verses, actually. The first one is in John chapter 20, verse 1. It says, In the first day of the week, which day is that? Sunday. When day did Jesus die? Friday, right? We, Jesus died on Friday. He was in the grave on Saturday, and he rose up on Sunday. The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early, when it was yet dark unto the sepulcher, and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulcher. She goes running around. She wants to see. She thinks Jesus has been stolen, his body. But in verse 17, as Jesus sees her and she recognizes him, this is what he says to her. Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended unto my Father. But go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father, and to your Father, and to go and to my God and your God. He says, to, he says to her, don't touch me, I haven't yet gone to the Father. I've been in the grave, but I haven't yet gone. I'm going to go. He says, I, I ascend there, and then I'm going to come and meet him. So Jesus died on Friday, he was in the grave on Sabbath, and Sunday morning, in that first week, day of the week when he rose, Mary Magdalene came to him and he said, I have not yet gone to heaven. But he told the thief that that day he would be with him in paradise. So we're really in a mess now, aren't we? Because Jesus didn't go to heaven on Friday when he died. He didn't go to heaven on Saturday when he was dead. He, he, he didn't go to heaven until Sunday morning. So now we've got, we've got, we're totally confused. So how, how do we rectify this scripturally? Because the Bible tells us, everything we've read in the Bible says when that thief was going to die, he was going to fall asleep, and he was going to not know anything, and he's going to stay sleeping until Jesus calls his name on resurrection day, right? That's what the Bible has been teaching. That's the promise for all of us who are believers that Jesus will raise us up on the resurrection day. To go back and look at that verse, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Now let me tell you a thing about the scriptures. When the Bible was written, there wasn't one piece of punctuation in the Bible. There are no periods, there are no commas, there's no quotation marks, there's no verse numbers, there's no chapter numbers. It was just all script. We put chapters in. Oftentimes, have you ever been reading a chapter and it seems like a chapter stops and you start the next chapter and it seems like, oh, it seems like that goes with the chapter before? That's because there was no chapter break. There were no verses. It was all just, it was all just writing. And we put the verses and chapters in there so it's easier to research and for us to find where, we're, you know, when I say go to Luke 23, 43, you know, you're not having to go through a scroll and trying to find that spot somewhere. And so we have these verses and Bibles and punctuation was put in the, by the translators when they made it in English so they could figure out how, when we were speaking how we would do it. But depending on where you put punctuation makes a huge difference in writing, right? It does. Take a look at this. A simple statement. A woman, comma, without her man, comma, is nothing. But if you move the comma in a different place, it says a woman without her, man is nothing. Completely opposite meaning, is it not? I mean, I mean that's just a simple example, but the comma makes a huge difference, doesn't it? I mean, here it, it changed the meaning of the, of the sentence completely on its end. Totally different. So if we look at the verse in Luke where they put the comma and we say, Assuredly I say to you, comma, today you will be with me in paradise. It doesn't match anything else in Scripture. It doesn't match when Jesus went to heaven. It doesn't match any of the text that the Bible says what happens when we die. 
And so we're totally confused because Jesus said that he's going to come back to receive us unto himself, that where he is, there we might be also at the second coming. That's when he's coming to get us to be with him in paradise. So, so that doesn't make any sense. So this one verse is just like totally out of the blue. Off in left field doesn't make any doctrinal scriptural sense with the rest of the Bible. But if we move the comma one space over or read it without a comma, take your pick. Assuredly, I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. You see how it makes a difference? Jesus is saying, look, today I'm hanging on this cross. But this young man had already looked at him and said, hey, he hasn't done anything wrong. He doesn't deserve to die. And he looks at him and he says, Lord. He recognized Jesus as the Savior and the Messiah to come. And Jesus is hanging on the cross in looks like defeat. In the most embarrassing, most disgusting way to die. It was the, it was the criminals, it, it was a bad way to die. It was an unclean way to die. He was, he was made sin for us. Shame on me. He was made sin for us. And he's hanging on the tree in apparent defeat. And he looks at this young man who just recognized him as his Savior and he says, I, you will be with me in paradise. I'm saying to you today, even though I look like I'm defeated, this is a victory. This is a victory for you. Because anybody like you who looks at me and sees the Savior is going to be with me in paradise. That's the meaning of that verse. And it's the only way it fits with all of the other scripture. It just means that the guy who is writing it slipped the comma in one word too early. Doesn't mean that the word of God is not inspired. It just means the comma wasn't inspired. That's all. There's another verse in the Bible that has an issue sometimes because people will say, well, if we die, it's better for us to be present with the Lord, right? So it says in First, Second Corinthians 5, verses 1 through 10, it says, we, say, we are confident, I say, rather willing to be absent from the body, present with the Lord, right? Let's take a look at that real quickly. Second Corinthians chapter 5. Second Corinthians chapter 5. I want you to look, remember... We take all the context, we take all the verses of the Bible, right? All the verses about a topic, and so we've been taking as many verses as we possibly can in the limited time that we have regarding the idea of what happens when I die, what state I am when I'm dead, why shouldn't I be speaking to the dead people? And we've come across all of these verses that are all synonymous, they're all equal, except now we've run into this one in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1-10, through 10, which seems to say that when I die, I go directly to be with God. And it, honestly, there's only one or two texts in all of Scripture that give any other indication that what the rest of Scripture says isn't true. And so we have to look at the weight of Scripture. We've got all these texts about the Bible that says when you die, you sleep, you don't know anything, you're not going to raise up until Jesus comes and gets you at the last day. And then you run into a text here and a text there, and you, a lot of people will hold two texts here and 55, 65 texts here and say, you know, uh, these 65 texts, that, that we're going to do away with those, we're going to hold on to these two. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. So what does the Bible say here in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1-10? through 10? This is Paul speaking, teaching to the Corinthians. We've, he's already taught the Corinthians. We're going to look at that earlier. For we know this, know that if our earthly house, that's our body, of this tabernacle were dissolved, which means we die, we dissolve, we have a building of God and house not made with hands, eternal in heaven. Once God comes and gets you, the Bible says this mortal is going to put on immortality, this corruptible is going to put on incorruption, we get a glorified body. God's ready to give you that when he comes, but we don't have it yet. He's saying God's got it ready for us. For in this we groan, this earthly house, this body, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. Don't you want to go to heaven? Paul is saying, look, I'm earnestly desiring to be with God. I would love to be with Jesus. And me too. I mean, I was praying today with a friend of mine. I said, Lord, come quick. I'm so tired of the junk that goes on in this world and the chaos and the confusion and the pain and the suffering. I want him to come. I want to go be with the Lord. I'm tired of this world. Paul's saying the same thing. Verse 3, so if, that, if, be, if, so, if so be that being clothed, <clears throat> we shall not be found naked. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened, not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon, that mortality might be swallowed up of life. Now that's an important statement, because Paul has already taught the, these people about when mortality will be swallowed up with life. Right? 
We're going to look at that in just a moment. So he says, their swall- mortality is going to be swallowed up with immortality. Verse 5 says, Now he that hath wrought us for the selfsame thing is God, who hath also given us unto this etern- earnest of the Spirit. Therefore, we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are yet at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. If you're here alive, we're absent from God. For we walk by faith and not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing, rather, to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Wherefore, we labor that we, whether present or absent, we may be accepted of Him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every one may receive the things done in his body, whether according to that he hath done, whether it be good or whether it be bad. Jesus says, Behold, I am coming quickly to give every man according to his works shall be. But that's at the second coming. And that last verse says we all must sit be, beside that throne. So what, what about this verse? Does it mean that when you die, you go to be with heaven? Not at all. He's talking about having our earthly body changed into a glorified body and having our mortality swallowed up in life or immortality. But Paul's already taught the Corinthians when that happens in his first letter, which we looked at already. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 51 through 55. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, which means we shall not all die. But we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, this mortal must put on immortality. That's exactly what he was saying there in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, this mortal shall have put on immortality. Then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? It's not when you die that you receive immortality. It's when Jesus comes. Paul's very clear. So, you you know, the Bible writers don't contradict themselves all the way through through Scripture. We just have to understand Scripture in the context of all the Scripture that the Bible talks about, whatever it may be. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 15 through 18 should seal the deal for the whole thing. It says, For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent or precede those which are asleep. Nobody's going in front of anybody, he says. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God, and who rises first? The dead in Christ shall rise first. If, why are they rising first if they're already in heaven? That doesn't make any sense. They haven't gone to heaven. They're still waiting for Jesus to call their name. So when he descends with the voice of an archangel and the trumpet of God, the trumpet is so loud, and that voice, what's that voice saying? He's saying, come forth, you who sleep in the dust. And the dead in Christ rise first, and then we who are alive and remain are caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air. We all go together. And we all go together. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Why is that comforting? Because, think of this, we all get to go together. The loved one that you lost, how, what kind of heaven would it be for them if they're looking down and seeing all the tru- struggles and trials of your life? How hard would it be for me to die and look down from heaven and watch my wife struggle through pain and suffering and sickness, and I can't be there to help her, and I can't do anything. That would be horrible for me. I would hate it. She might even find somebody better looking than me. (laughs) You know? What kind of heaven would that be? Right? That's very possible. But it would be bad. I mean, who wants to to do that? No, 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 no. the, The comfort is that we all get to go together when we die. It's just sleep. You don't, you don't even know anything that's happened. But the next thing you do know, Jesus is saying, come out of the grave and be with me. That's comforting. That's comforting. John 5, 28, Jesus says, Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in the which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice and shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. There are two separate resurrections in the Bible. Not just one, there's two. We're going to study those tomorrow night. Two resurrections in the Bible. So Jesus says, look, we have a promise of resurrection, but you know the wicked have a promised resurrection too. And he says there's coming an hour that that's going to happen. Daniel chapter 12, verse 13. When is Daniel getting it to his reward? The Bible says, but thou... Go thou thy way till the end be, for thou shalt rest, sleep, and stand in thy lot at the end of days. Daniel didn't go to heaven. He's waiting for his reward 
to go up to be with Jesus just when you and I, who are alive and remain, when he comes, get to go. Acts chapter 2, 29. Peter is speaking right after Jesus. You know, Jesus ascended not just a chapter ago here in Acts chapter 2. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us to this day. Did he go to heaven? No, for David is not ascended into the heavens. Why? Because when you die, you sleep. You don't go anywhere. You wait. God remembers you. You don't think God can remember everything about you? You know what? You know, in the Bible, the name of a person describes their character. That's what the name was significant of. In the Bible, it says that we're going to get a new name. Okay? Because we have a character that came from God, but God remembers your character. And so when He calls your name, what it's signifying is He's calling you forth just as you were when you went to sleep in your heart, your character. He's bringing you back the way you died. The way you were thinking, where your heart was with Jesus, you were saying, Lord, I, want to, I yearn to follow you. I want, to, I want to be with you. I want to give up all of this sinful life for you. I don't care about riches. I don't care about fame. I don't care about glory. I don't care about a house. I just want to be with you someday. And because of what you've done for me, and he remembers that, he remembers every aspect of your love for him and in the mind that you had, and he calls your name and he gives you a glorified body. No more glasses. Hallelujah. That's the promise. The promise of the resurrection. Jesus says that's when it's coming. John chapter 6, verse 40. I want you to look at this. John chapter 6, verse 40. Jesus tells me and you when he's raising us up. John chapter 6. Verse 39 and 40. Jesus is speaking, he says, And this is the Father's will, which hath sent me, that of all which he hath given me, I should, not, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, verse 40, that every one which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life. I will raise him up as soon as he dies. No, what does the Bible say? At the last day. Verse 44, No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. Beautiful. Verse 54, Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Jesus isn't raising you up as soon as you die. Not three days after you die, not four days after you die, unless, of course, that happens to be the last day. Because Jesus is coming on the last day, and he says, I will raise you up on the last day. That's the promise of the resurrection, folks. Look what he says. I will come and receive you because he's coming to receive us because he hasn't received anybody yet. The dead in Christ are going to rise because he hasn't received them in heaven yet. He's coming for everyone who's ever died Believing on His name, whether it be those in the Old Testament believing forward to what Jesus was going to do, or those of us from the, after the crucifixion looking back saying, we believe what Jesus has done. He's coming for all of us who've died in Jesus. He's going to call our names. We're going to get to rise up together with those who are living or believing with Jesus. We're going to be gathered together in the air. The angels are going to be swinging their way around, bringing families together. We're going to, to see Jesus together forever to be with the Lord on the last Day. Nobody goes first. So that's the truth about seances and ghosts. Ghosts are devils. People who talk to seance people, they're devils. Why do we know that? Because the Bible says when I die, I don't know anything. All my thoughts, all my emotions, everything is perished. I wait like to sleep in the ground until Jesus calls my name. It's peaceful. It's just. It's the way God has it designed. Because what it means is not only is not everybody in heaven who's ever died, it also means that those who've died long years ago who didn't know Jesus and didn't, didn't do anything terrible, they haven't been suffering in hell all this time. Because God is just and merciful. We're going to study that the next two nights. We're going to show you very, very distinctly, the mercy and the justness of God. 
We had to understand this so we can understand the judgment of God. And so as we leave tonight, remember that God has a truth of His Word. And we need to follow the Word wherever it leads us. To have a clear understanding of how God's going to deal with you and I, we have to understand that when we die, it's just a peaceful, peaceful sleep. We have nothing to fear, nothing to worry. Let's bow our heads tonight. Father in heaven, thank you for your word tonight. Lord, we, we lift you up as a wonderful, glorious creator and Lord. Lord, you know everything about us. You know our worries and our thoughts and our desires, our, our disappointments. Lord, you know every hair upon our head. And Lord, you promise that one day you're going to remember us. You're going to remember that we have faithfully loved you and served you and lived for you. And if we perhaps die before you come, you are going to call our names and we're going to hear you from the grave. And we're going to be raised up incorruptible. And you're going to give us the gift of immortality so we might live and reign with you. Oh Lord, we look forward to that day. Lord, tonight I pray that as we ponder the words of your scripture that you Lord would fill us with your Holy Spirit give us give us the wisdom from on high Lord let your word be our final answer for our faith let it be the safeguard we need to keep us on that narrow path that you said that we would have to walk on watch over us tonight Lord be with us protect us in Jesus name we pray amen Tomorrow night we're going to talk about the thousand-year millennial period. Okay, the thousand-year millennium. And so tomorrow night, that's what we're going to talk about. The thousand-year reign. Everybody talks about the thousand years. It's going to be a wonderful time on earth and this and that. We're going to look at the Bible, see what the Bible actually says about the thousand years. It ties into exactly what we've been talking to tonight. And then the night after that, we're going to be talking about the death of sin. The death of sin. Now tomorrow morning... As the pastor mentioned, I'm going to be preaching a, a sermon on, on God of grace or God of law. We're going to look at the two covenants, Old Covenant and New Covenant. And we're going to look at Romans chapter 6, verses 14 and 15, where it talks about the fact that you know, the Bible says you are no longer under law, but you are under grace. And so we're going to study that. What does that mean? What, what changed at the cross? We're going to find out that we're going to look at it very, very intensely tomorrow morning. So you don't want to miss that. If that's a thought in your mind saying, hey, we've got, a, we've got different covenants, we've got to, let's look at it, what the Bible says tomorrow morning. We're going to study that very closely. So I hope that you all come in the morning. You, you, know, you can come in the morning and then we eat in the afternoon and we come back in the evening so we can just kind of spend all day together, right? You know, I mean, it's, just, it's good that way. We can do that. And, and many of you who said, you know, I'd really like to experience the Sabbath of the Lord, you know, you're welcome to worship with us tomorrow morning because it's the Sabbath today. Uh, the sun is down and it's now the Sabbath of the Lord. And so come and worship with us in the morning and, and take part in another part of the series. So when you leave tonight, remember, you can go from this place, but you can never go so far to be beyond the reach of God's love. He loves you. He cares for you. He's always loved you. God bless you all and good night. And the ushers are at the door if you have an offering.